Hey everybody, welcome back to the second lecture video for this week. This time we're looking at the opposite reaction to the legalization of Christianity. We know in the first video we talked about how there were some that responded positively to that, and we noted about Eusebius and Augustine being as sort of two individuals that represented that view. This week we're looking at the other side of that, those that saw the legalization of Christianity to be a negative thing, uh, believe it or not. So we begin by talking about Donatism, and I know you've already read some about Donatism already, so what we're going to kind of do is sort of both reinforce and maybe add in some new details uh, as it concerns both of these, uh, both of these, uh, uh, both of these developments that sort of affect uh, or that represent a, a more negative viewpoint of the legalization of Christianity. So. One thing we keep in mind about Donatism is that there is a division that is going on in the churches of Corinth. And again, this is following after the end of Diocletian's persecution. If we remember back during Decius' persecution in the middle of the third century, we had a, you know, there was a controversy going on in the church of Carthage then about uh, Cyprian and Ovation, about how to handle those that are uh, wanting to be restored back to the church even though they might have lapsed and uh, uh, you know sort of uh, gave up on Christianity to to avoid persecution you had that but now we've got another division that's going on in the church of Corinth this concerns the appointing of a bishop uh, named uh, Cecilian and part of the problem with this is that one of the bishops that put forth Sicilian and, and, and was part of the council to approve him to, to make him Bishop of Carthage. Uh, it turns out he was one of those uh, Christians that had handed over scriptures to the Roman authorities during the persecution under the reign of Diocletian. And the problem is, is that there were some that thought that he wasn't really qualified because of that to vote on such a very important matter. Uh, in fact, there were some bishops that there were some others uh, in the surrounding area that nominated their own guy and this is uh, a man by the name of uh, Majorinus and then later the the man that succeeds Majorinus is Donatus uh, who is again the you know the Donatism is obviously founded off of his name um, because he would uh, succeed, um, succeed Majorinus so there's some people that, that want Majorinus because he doesn't really have this problem that the, that the other bishop had. Um, you know, um, so one of the things about this is that for Majorinus uh, and, and Donatus, they are, uh, again, selected by uh, the opponents to Sicilian, but they're not in the majority. The people of Carthage like Sicilian better. Uh, and it turns out that Sicilian is also going to have the support of the emperor. And that, that division is sort of the uh, beginning point for the rise of Donatism. And it's now important to keep in mind what their perspective was on Christianity in the empire. And for the Donatists, they sort of value the idea of separation. And... There are a couple of reasons why they would do this. Um, one, of course, they were loyal to their bishops, and so because there's this division going on, they didn't necessarily like to be. Uh, they they did not like the idea of being uh, in, in association with Sicilian and those that supported him, even the emperor, and so they weren't going to get along. They were uh, naturally a, a splintered group from that. Uh, at the same time. Anybody who really supported Sicilian, um, the Donatists would not uh, fellowship with them and essentially would cut them off. And so, really, the Donatists, again, are a thorn to unity. And again, we mentioned before that Augustine has to deal with this uh, because, again, Augustus was a man, Augustine, the, uh, the theologian that we talked about in the first lecture video, he's a man that liked unity. And the Donatists were very much a separatist group. They did not, not have any problem not having unity. And there's sort of two ex examples or what we might call episodes that illustrate just how uh, and to what extent of a separation the Donatists had from um, what is really the, the mainstream form of Christianity in the Roman Empire at the time. 
One event considered the uh, concerned the bishop of Bagai, whose name was Maximian. Now, Maximian was a bishop that was originally a Donatist, but then had recently converted. And he, again, is put in power uh, by, you know, the mainstream Christian church at that time, which is what is growing into Catholicism. And so there's an incident where Maximian is actually attacked by some Donatists uh, while he is in uh, the church building. They take him, they beat him, they drag him out. Um, they use a machete to beat him with, so, you know, a very bloody thing. Um, they take him to the edge of town, they leave him for dead. And uh, that was one incident. There was another incident where some Donatist uh, had taken him and ha had beaten him some and actually thrown him off a tower. Um, and he was actually saved because he actually landed in a pile of manure. But the point being is that this is an example that the Donatist... Um, were uh, very much a separatist people. They didn't mind have, they didn't mind the idea of using violence to uh, to uh, get what they wanted, so to speak. There's also another episode that sort of shows this, maybe in a different way, and that concerns the Conference of Carthage. And this was called to sort of reconcile the differences between the Donatist and the uh, bishops that supported Sicilian and, and those that would be on that side. Now, this does happen later in time. This is about 411 A.D. when this conference is called. And there are an equal number of representatives on each side. So 284 Donatists uh, with 284 of the, the mainstream Christian bishops at the time. And before they even get to start the meeting, the Donatists refuse to sit in the same building with the, uh, the other bishops. And again, this reflects their separatism. And this is about the summertime in, you know, in North Africa in the summertime, it's pretty warm. Uh, it can be pretty warm. So the, because the Donatists refuse to sit in the building, they actually just have a meeting outside in the heat. And as you might guess, nothing really gets accomplished by that, um, which later leads on to imperial decrees that are made to force the Donatists to reconcile with, you know, the mainstream uh, bishops in, in the church at the time, which again, we, we mentioned that with Augustine, but also begins to show us why maybe the Donatists did not look at the legalization of Christianity in a positive light because, you know, really they and their position is still being under attack um, by this other, by what, what is now the mainstream form of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit more about the motive for separation. You do have a concern for the Donatists about the purity of the church. And this in part comes from the legalization of Christianity because what happens with that for the Donatists is that you've got worldliness now that can enter into the church. You've got it in one sense because of a bishop who is unqualified to elect another bishop because this is where all of this sort of began to happen. And so with these unqualified bishops, even at the top, You've got worldliness coming into the leadership. You've got other bishops that are allying with them, uh, with, with the, the mainstream bishops in the church. And so that, that presents a great problem. And so anything that those bishops did in terms of worship service or anything that went on at those churches um, that were not Donatists, the Donatists viewed everything that they did as worthless. Like it had no value. Um, it was illegitimate worship. And so the Donatist, anyone who wanted to become a Donatist that was a part of the uh, part of the mainstream Christianity at the time, had to go through a process of being rebaptized um, to be baptized, really as a Donatist. And so there's a great concern about purity in the church, but this is not always consistent. Um, you have examples where some Donatists did accept in people that had denied the faith. Um, which again, that was one of the major breaking points there at the very beginning. Uh, there was also a, a Donatist uh, leader called Purpurius, um, and it was well reported and well known that he had some of his nephews killed. And so, you know, here are examples of some men that are not really pure at all. So there's a lack of consistency in terms of um, this idea that they were solely concerned about the purity of the church. More than likely, one of the bigger 
at least in my mind, one of the most important motives for separation concerns economic and cultural factors. And in part, this is sort of seen by the fact that the, the location where each, the, where, the, where the strongholds of each location were, because um, they weren't always in the same vicinity. And I'm going to pull up a uh, map of um, North Africa. Let me maximize the uh, screen for you all so that way you can be able to see um, the, uh, the map a little bit better. Well, oh, well, let me get that banner out of the way real quick. All right, so there we go. All right, so I'll pull this up on the PowerPoint in a minute, but again, we're talking about you know Carthage there on the, the northern coast of Africa, which is right here. And this is going to be the main stronghold for Sicilian and his supporters. Um, those that are more allied with the emperor and those that are allied with mainstream Christianity. Really going to be centered in North Africa in this portion. Um, so that's where their stronghold is. However, the Donatists are primarily stronger in, in um, two places that will be listed in a moment, Numidia and Mauritania. And both of these places are to the west um, of Carthage, so generally in this area of North Africa. And so you've got a regional difference here that's going to play a role um, because it plays a role in terms of looking at the economy as well. I may just leave it like, leave the screen like that since uh, I'll go back and forth. All right, so you're looking at economic and cultural factors that matter here. And so location does matter. And this pertains to the economy because the economy of Numidia and Mauritania are primarily agriculture in nature, whereas in Carthage, you've got a lot more trade going on. And that's going to play a role in terms of some economic factors. Again, so the Donatists, again, living in a region that's primary, primarily agricultural, most of the produce in that area would be shipped to Italy, um, and that's how they make their money, because the crops would go to, to Italy, and it would run through Carthage. And so Carthage sort of acted as a middleman uh, in the process of this. And what happened was is that the middlemen in Carthage generally made a lot more money than those who put in more labor and more risk that are growing the crops in Numidia and Mauritania. And that again causes a problem, a concern. Again, the Donatists sort of frowned upon the worldliness of the church and um, the elite. And that in part reflects the, the concerns of their region because Numidia and Mauritania are, are relatively less wealthy than Carthage. Even those in the lower classes of Carthage generally sided with, were, were, were a lot more partial towards those in Numidia and Mauritania than the elite in the city of Carthage. You've also got the fact that Carthage at this point is a, what was called a Romanized city and that it's adopted and embraced Roman customs and traditions. And Donatists generally kept their uh, traditions. You don't see as much, uh, what we might say is Romanization or the Roman culture spreading quite as extensively in Numidia and Mauritania. And those that are in those regions generally saw the Roman uh, empire as a source of oppression rather than a uh, being proud citizens more to say again there are many wealthy people then who would live in the city of Carthage because of the the process of Romanization so that those economic and cultural factors really do play a difference in in how you know the Donatists are sort of separated from the uh, the mainstream church which is stronger in Carthage you also want to keep in mind the history of Christianity in North Africa. 
Again, these are the two regions. Generally, before Constantine, Christianity was stronger in Numidia and Mauritania than it was in Carthage. However, once Constantine embraces Christianity, more of the Roman elite begin to embrace Christianity. And so there are more Christians that begin to live in Car uh, Carthage because there are more that converted. Those, that, those Christians that lived in Carthage before Constantine, they often broke rank with the, uh, if you were wealthy in Carthage and you converted to Christianity before Constantine, a lot of times they broke rank from these other elites because the idea of being a Christian and a good Roman citizen were a lot of times at odds because, again, of the Roman religion in the empire before Constantine. However, after Constantine becomes a Christian, the idea of being a good Roman citizen and a good Christian becomes a lot more plausible. And that's why you see a lot of people in Carthage again, begin to convert after Constantine accepts Christianity. Well, those in New Media that are watching this going on sort of see this again as worldliness is now entering into the church. Again, the corruption, the uh, immorality that had been characteristic of the Roman elite who had practiced paganism a lot of times, uh, there was now the, the viewpoint of the Donatists that this is beginning to enter into the church. Uh, and again, this is all built again on the idea that they, uh, because of their economic and cultural situation, they already did not like the Roman Empire. Now the Roman Empire is sort of forming an alliance with the church, which discussed a lot of the Donatists. Sicilian, again, would have the support of the emperor, those of the elite, the Numidians, um, and the, uh, the, the clergy of the Numidians, the, the church official of the Numidians, the Lower classes generally, uh, uh, generally were more favorable towards the Donatist. You've also got one other factor that sort of is another motive for separation beyond the economic, the cultural, and the development of uh, and, and the spread of Christianity throughout that region. And one of the one of the extremist groups that comes out of the Donatist are, is a group called the Circumcellions. They are primarily peasants made up from Numidia and Mauritania, and they begin to embrace again the idea of martyrdom. But this time, instead of being martyrs dying at the hands of you know, Roman officials or Roman pagans, their martyrdom would come from fighting against apostates, primarily those that supported the church in Carthage. And they're really going to make life tough for people in that area. Um, one of the things that was characteristic, they, they often took over the estates of the wealthy by force. Um, they, would, they were known to uh, sort of act as robbers in that area uh, to, to, uh, to attack the wealthy and, and really those that supported the, the church in Carthage. Um, they were even so maybe devoted, we might could say, that sometimes they even committed mass suicide. Uh, and there, there are at least one occasion where there's a record of them committing mass suicide by jumping off of a cliff, at least some of them. And, and so this is a very extremist group, but you know this, this extremism obviously is going to motivate more Donatists to be separated from the church in Carthage and mainstream Christianity. Um, even though they are not a major, they're not, it's not like half of these people are circumcellions. There's only a small portion that are. Sometimes the Donatists would employ the circumcellions in their battles um, uh, in altercations between the, the church and Carthage. And Rome actually tries to end the, the, this group of terrorists, but they're unsuccessful in that. And it's actually not going to be until you have the invasion, uh, the conquest of the Muslims in the uh, in the 8th and 9th centuries where you're going to see the Donatists sort of um, uh, disappear from the record. But the Donatists sort of again represent a group that did not like the legalization of Christianity uh, as evident by their actions. So they take one extreme in terms of purging the church, sometimes even using violence to accomplish their means. However, there is another group that we now talk about that doesn't take that same route. And we, again, we keep in mind that they do have similar concerns to the Donatists. Again, really for 
those that are going to embrace monasticism, become monks and nuns and, and develop monasteries. Again, what it looked like on the surface with Christianity being adopted by the empire is that now, you know, Matthew 7, where Jesus talks about the straight gate and the narrow way, well, that seems to have widened a good bit at this point because of how many people are converting to Christianity. There's a concern that some saw Christianity as really just another form of opportunism, that is to rise up in society, to acquire a better position in life. Um, uh, people would, there was the concern people were doing that by trying to convert to Christianity. And so genuine conversion wasn't happening anymore. You've got how bishops are being appointed, and now it's really not so much they're being appointed because they deserve that place, but it's more of a political thing. And if you know the right people, if you make the right connections, you can rise up faster. And there are some people that are disgusted with this. Um, and in all this, again, we keep in mind that there's no persecution going on. So one of the things that, one of the main events really in the first three centuries that was sort of viewed as determining a person's faith, the validity of it, no longer exists because persecution to a large extent has gone away. And so some see this as a moment where Satan is really laying a trap um, by the legalization of Christianity in the empire. Uh, and so the, there's a the viewpoint that it's not a, uh, not a good thing at all. The difference, again, with the, between the Donatist and those that are monks and nuns is obviously the way in which they respond, um, which I know uh, your reading sort of covered this, but again, you think about the, the idea of flight versus fight, whereas the Donatists were ones who were going to fight the, those that become monks and nuns generally uh, embrace the idea of fleeing from society in order to maintain their purity and holiness. And in one sense, it's a, it's a good idea compared to the Donatists because you know, now you're not going to have to worry about the inconsistencies that they have in, in yourself um, modeling those same inconsistencies. Right again, the Donatists were trying to fight against the impurity in the church, but they themselves were very impure by the way in which they responded uh, through violence, um, being one of the one of the means of it. So the, the so the monks and nuns are not going to make that same problem by fleeing from society, but they do raise a larger question, though, right? And that's how can you fight against sin when you remove yourself from the world? Because um, it's one thing; it's obviously important to maintain your holiness. But again, you know, you can't have you can't convert somebody to Christianity uh, if you're never around people that are not Christians. And um, that becomes a that becomes a, a a question. I know that was sort of the idea of the discussion board, thinking about it in that sense. Um, but we'll we'll talk more about monastics um, moving forward after this too. But um, that's one thing we're going to keep noting again. How can you fight against sin when you remove yourself from the world? Um, when you think about the origins of monasticism, the, the term itself just means solitary. And I'll give you an illustration that is really seen as the first instance in which the term um, monastic, the root of that was used to describe a person. Um, there was a document that was discovered. It was written around the time of Arius uh, and Arianism's grip in Alexandria. So you're talking about the early 300s, um, early 4th century. It was a uh, petition that was signed. Um, the, the petition was a complaint that a neighbor uh, had made about another neighbor. Um, the petition was that there was a neighbor's... Um, the person that made the petition complained that his neighbor's cow had trampled and destroyed the plantings in his field. Um, so the man catches the cow. Um, I'm reading this correct. The, uh, this has happened more than once. So the man who had his field, um, so the man goes and catches his cow. He takes it back to the village um, after it had trampled the man's land. And as he's going down the road, he runs into a group of bandits. And, or no, no, I'm sorry. I got that backwards. 
Uh, so again, let me clarify the um, the it's not the owner who gets the cat the cow, right? So the the owner of the cow, his cow goes and destroys his neighbor's field. The neighbor takes the cow and he's taking it back to the owner uh, up the road. And as he's taking it back to the owner, the owner and the owner's friends come up and they begin to beat the man that's taking the cow back. Um, and they've got clubs and they're doing it. And he's almost beaten to death when two individuals step in. Um, there was a deacon named Antonius and a monk named Isaac that stepped in and kept the owner and his friends from beating his neighbor uh, for bringing back his cow. And this is the first uh, document that we have that shows um, somebody, a Christian, being referred to as a monk. Um, so what that points out is that, you know, the, the um, really a, an official evidence, you, you see that monks do go back to at least the 4th century um, before Constantine. Um, but they're going to grow in, in importance later on. You've also got some other... You also got some other influences as well. Um, Galen, who is a, uh, was a Greek physician, had this to say about Christians, uh, about, a, about a certain Christian community. He said that in this community, not only men but women who refrain from cohabiting through their lives and practice self-control in matters of food and drink, which is uh, some, something that is characteristic of the monastic way of life as we as we'll see moving forward. Um, the same way with Origen. Origen talked about uh, those that sort of did the same thing. Origen himself uh, put some restrictions on what he ate and, and the way in which he lived. And so maybe he, he uh, sort of represents some early, early attempts at, uh, at, you know, at some of the things that are characteristics of monasteries and things like that. I know the lesson that you read uh, in the textbook, um, you, you see the influence of the Essenes, the Qumran community, uh, as being important to Christianity. You also want to keep in mind the Gnostic influence as well. I know it's been a while since we've talked about that, but we keep in mind that those two very extremes that Gnosticism went to about because the body and the spirit, the body was seen as inherently evil. Um, there were some that went to the extreme that since the body is inherently evil, you can't do anything about it, so that gives you the license to sin all the more. But then there were others, again, that went back and said that because the body is sinful, you should do whatever it takes to limit that sinfulness. You, you need to bring into control the passions of the flesh. Uh, and so some Gnostic groups sort of practiced uh, some early forms of, of monasticism. Um, so that's very important. Uh, to keep in mind, those are some, some influences. Again, you've got the Jewish influence as well. All right, so in part with the development of monasticism, one, point, one thing that you want to keep in mind is the location. <clears throat> Let me get, take a drink for a minute. So again, what's important is you want to get in a place that's away from society. For those that were trying to flee from society, one popular place was the desert. At least early on, that's a pretty popular location. And this is not necessarily because that it is a harsh place. Sometimes when we think about, you know, the way of living for a monk or a nun, it's about making it as hard on yourself as possible. Uh, this wasn't really the idea that they had in mind, but the, the important point about the desert is that generally it was inex, in a, inaccessible. Inaccessible. Because... Generally, people aren't going to go out to the desert because there's not a lot of things out there you know, to rely on to survive. And so cities generally were built around locations of water. But if you wanted to get away from people, generally it would be a good idea to live uh, in the desert. Um, not just Christians practicing this, but those that ran from the government uh, for whatever reason. I know in Egypt, at the same time as Antony, again, who the, who the author of the, the chapter in the textbook mentions, um, you've got some that were in Egypt that fled from being taxed by the empire, and sometimes they would go to the desert. So this is not just Christians that were sort of doing this. Um, there were different groups of people that had this practice of going out to the desert to try to get away from people. 
It becomes more famous for Christians uh, in the develop of, de development of monasteries. Uh, so I'll talk about Antony and a few Antony and Pacomius for a couple of minutes. I know, again, he, he's talked about a lot in the textbook. Antony sometimes thought about as the founder of monasticism, um, but really his importance to monasticism comes from a man named Athanasius who wrote a biography about him. And this biography would be translated and delivered to a variety of locations. And so the, the story of Antony becomes very intriguing. A lot of people hear about this story, and that's sort of why he grows in popularity. So Antony was a man that grew up in Egypt. Uh, he lived among the wealthy until his parents died, and then his wealth was sort of entrusted to him for the time being. And Antony was a Christian, and what the story uh, tells us is that he had recently be, been reading um, uh, a passage out of Acts chapter 2, really, where, where it talks about those in the church selling their possessions to give to those in need. Um, and as he's going to church and he's just recently read this, he hears a sermon that comes from Matthew 19 about the rich young ruler and why he could not follow after Christ because he wouldn't part with his possessions. And so what this does is, is it motivates Antony to go and sell his goods and to really become, uh, really to become a monk uh, in that sense. There was, a, there was a man that lived in the same area that, that sort of practiced the same thing about withdrawing himself from the village to go out into the desert. And even though Antony is going to go out into the desert, he's not that far away from the village to where people can't uh, know about him. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have a book about him if he completely cut himself off from society. But he goes and lives in the desert. He's close to the village. He generally reject, he rejected wealth. He did, all, did a lot of work with his hands. And the people that were in the village nearby, they admired him, which helped, again, with the author in writing that story. And so Antony would practice, again, solitary monasticism or would practice it on his own and not in a community like we would often think about monks and nuns today. Pacomius also becomes important because, as the textbook said, he was one of the first to embrace the idea of communal monasticism or forming monasteries with monks and with nuns. And again, he developed a sort of a pattern of life, a way that, that, that the monks would live. And I'm going to pull up... Uh, an excerpt talking about it from one of the books that I'm reading. Uh, and this is what the author had to say about it. He said, At first, Pacomius brought solitaries who lived in the same vicinity together, but as the numbers grew, he established new foundations in other places and organized them into close knit communities under a single head. The monks followed a regime of regular times of prayer, work, and meals, and Pacomius composed the first monastic rule, a collection of directives and precepts to govern their common life. They lived not in caves or huts, but in a complex of buildings that would eventually include a kitchen, bakery, dining hall, infirmary, assembly hall, and church. The community was divided into houses with space for 40 monks, each with his own cell where he slept and prayed. They wore a distinctive garb called a habit, a sleeveless tunic belted at the waist with a hood and a goatskin cloak. And this is sort of how the, the actual day went, worship. In the early morning, the community gathered while it was still dark for communal prayer, each monk in his assigned place. The reader stood at an ambo, or reading desk. At the complete of each reading from the scripture, he clapped his hands, and the monk stood, make, stood to make the sign of the cross and recite the Lord's Prayer. A second clap signaled that they were to be seated. Surprisingly, in the Pacomian monasteries, the monks plated reeds into baskets during the reading of the Scripture. And the rest of the day was spent in manual labor, baking, gardening, tanning, sandal making, and so on. In the evening, they gathered again for communal prayer. And they actually celebrate the Lord's Supper twice, on Wednesday and on Sunday. And that comes from a book called The First Thousand Years, written by Robert Williken, um, which is one of the books that I'm reading in, con in conjunction with the textbook, um, with other books, and with um, Maddox's book. That's sort of an idea. There's a, sis uh, 
a systematic way of doing things, and this is going to become more important uh, as we'll talk about later on um, with, again, Benedict and uh, Basil. But the monks themselves grew criti drew criticism from the Roman authorities and from church officials as well. When you think about what they are doing, essentially, um, the Roman officials obviously found the, uh, the, the lifestyle of the monks to be sort of uh, disgraceful in a way. Um, they are typically people that sort of rejected the nice things in life, sort of seen as outsiders by many Roman officials. Um, again, they sort of weren't participants in social life and things like that. So some Roman officials that were still pagan at the time looked down on them. But the Christian, even, even uh, I, I say they're clergy, but church officials really, sometimes they frowned upon monks as well. Um, because they posed a threat to their authority. And, and we'll talk more about that later on. But they do draw criticism from both of those uh, ranks. And so, again, that's another way in which we could see that, you know, monas monks and nuns by fleeing from society is one way in which they, they sort of sowed their disdain for the legalization of Christianity. But at the same time, the fact that, you know, Roman imperial officials and, and church officials are upset with them again, sort of shows that they didn't necessarily agree with the, um, they didn't necessarily view favorably the legalization of Christianity in the Roman Empire. And monasteries, of course, certainly still have an importance, just like, you know, the, the church, stru church structure of the Catholic Church is still important because Catholicism still exists. Monasteries as well still exist, and they become a very important point moving forward, not just in terms of just existing, but in terms of the uh, the development of intellectual thought, the keeping of records, the copy of older documents, they've become very important. And we will continue to talk about them more going forward. But again, the monastics, they differ from the Donatists. They are not a violent people. And they really begin to grow in number after Constantine becomes emperor because there's a concern about worldliness and they don't want to be influenced by worldliness in the church. And so they flee, flee in large part from uh, mainstream society. With that being said, we'll go ahead and stop this video here and we'll pick up with a third lecture video talking about some events and some important people in the last few decades of the Roman Empire in the West. But thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. Uh, and keep in mind that this lecture video and the next lecture video will be a part of the midterm test. So make sure that you're taking notes and make sure that you are studying.